Hey guys, welcome to episode 5 of Geography 101. Today we're going to be talking about the Arctic tundra. So the Arctic tundra is found within above the Arctic Circle in northern Siberia, shown here, which is part of Russia, um, Alaska and Canada. So there is a very cold climate here, eight to nine months of the year. It, the temperature is below freezing, average temperatures are below freezing. This means that the ground is permanently frozen, permafrost. Um, and this thaws in the summer months, which are several months in the year. Um, and that results in an active layer, which is about a meter of melted soil. So during the summer months, the days are very long, with only a few hours of night, if any hours. The top layer of permafrost melts, and this is known as the active layer. So this allows some plants and vegetation to grow in the active layer. Um, these are small shrubby plants, so there's no large trees. So during winter, it is very dark. Um, the days are very short and then for several weeks um, there is literally no, the sun doesn't rise, it is, there's no daylight, it's literally night all of the time. Um, and because plants require light for photosynthesis um, and water um, to be available for photosynthesis, um, there is no vegetation growth during this time or like practically none. So next I'm going to talk about the water cycle in the Arctic tundra. Um, so firstly, there's very low precipitation, um, only 50 to 350 millimetres per year, which is really hardly anything. And this mostly falls in the form of snow. This is because of the low humidity in the atmosphere very low moisture, there's hardly any water in the atmosphere, um, so there's not enough for it to really build up clouds. Um, this is because there's hardly any plants that can transpire water to the atmosphere, and because of the low temperatures, there's also very low evaporation rates from the soil and from leaves of the few plants that there are. Um, the groundwater stores are also quite small, um, this is because the permafrost is a barrier to infiltration and percolation of water down into groundwater stores um, because it's really impermeable. Snow and ice make up a large proportion of the water storm. Um, it's mostly solid and so, yeah, there's not much available for vegetation growth. So during summer there's more vegetation, but I'll go into that in a sec. Snow and ice melts, which obviously means that vegetation, more vegetation can grow. Um, but it also pools in on the ground because the permafrost is a barrier to infiltration. Um, so there's a lot of wetlands, ponds and lakes on the surface of the ground in the tundra. Um, the um, first layer, uh, top layer of permafrost melts. This is called the active layer. And um, this means that the ground has enough kind of moisture in it to let plants grow. So there's very slow decomposition in the tundra because the temperatures are low, so microorganisms can't decompose things as fast. So a large store of carbon is in the permafrost, um, 1,600 gigatons globally, which is quite a lot. This is because of the slow decomposition. So plants die, they're frozen rather than decomposing, and decomposing would release the CO2 to the atmosphere, but it doesn't. Um, there are small plants, so this means that the carbon store in biomass is very low, in above ground biomass that is. Um, so there are few plants, so very low um, net primary productivity. Um, not much photosynthesis goes on because there's not much carbon stored in the atmosphere. Um, this is because usually decomposition provides carbon to the atmosphere, but because there's 
um, no, not much decomposition. There's not going to be much carbon in the atmosphere. During summer, there is more vegetation um, because there's more carbon dioxide available for them to photosynthesize. Um, they during summer the plants are a good so store uh, source for um, carbon into the soil because when they die they are buried and um, stored in the permafrost as is shown here. So the more temperatures mean that there can be a few microorganisms which aid in decomposition and also the active layer thaws which means that plants can grow and also decompose a little bit which provides CO2 and methane to the atmosphere. So climate change is having an impact on the um, carbon cycle and water cycle in the tundra. Um, so, so warming results in permafrost melting um, and permafrost is a really large store of carbon in the tundra uh, but it can also become a source of carbon through decomposition. Um, so decomposition increases which releases carbon dioxide which increases the atmospheric store of carbon and also it releases methane which also really increases the atmospheric store of carbon. Methane is actually 20 times worse as a greenhouse gas um, and insulates the earth a lot more, resulting in even more of a warming effect than carbon dioxide. So the increased carbon dioxide means that there is more carbon dioxide available for photosynthesis, so more vegetation grows. Um, this does take a bit of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but honestly, it won't be enough to reverse the climate change that is happening. But nevertheless, net primary productivity has increased as a result of this. So that's how much carbon dioxide plants are fixing. The vegetation creates a negative feedback loop, which means CO2 rises, which increases photosynthesis. Um, and photosynthesis takes in CO2 which um, decreases the amount of photosynthesis in the atmosphere. Moving on to the water cycle, currently a lot of water is stored in permafrost and snow and ice, uh, but as permafrost melts, um, this means that more plants can grow. This results in more evapotranspiration, which provides more water for the atmospheric store of water, which results in more precipitation. This can be viewed as a positive feedback loop because more precipitation results in more plants growing and thus more evaporation. High temperatures means snow and ice melt. Snow and ice naturally have high reflectiveness or high albedo, so as they melt the ground becomes darker, albedo decreases, this means that the ground absorbs more soil which makes it warmer and this results in higher temperatures and this is a positive feedback loop which is very bad because it means that more climate change and global warming will occur. So now on to some direct human impacts. Um, so near Prudhoe Bay in Alaska, um, in the tundra, um, oil and gas were discovered. So people wanted to get this gas and oil and so they constructed things such as pipelines, roads to get around the place, oil production facilities and plants, gas processing facilities um, and so on and so forth um, in order to get the oil and gas. So this means some of the permafrost has melted around there um, and this is as a result of the direct heat that the machinery and pipelines exert but also the dust which makes the ground darker and reduces albedo um, and also the removal of vegetation which normally insulates the permafrost. So permafrost melting releases CO2 and methane to the atmosphere which as we know is pretty bad. The removal of vegetation is also bad because it's slow growing so it's hard to get back and vegetation removes carbon from the atmosphere. Permafrost melting increases surface runoff 
which is how it affects the water cycle. And also wa uh, water being abstracted from the ground, from the few groundwater stores is also an impact of oil and gas uh, drilling in Alaska. Some people are trying to reduce the impact of human activity in Alaska. Um, so some management techniques are as follows. Um, so firstly, roads and other features can be constructed on ice to insulate the permafrost below. Um, they can also be elevated. This allows cold air to circulate beneath them. Drilling laterally or sideways allows fewer drilling sites to be built, um, which kind of minimises the impact that um, the oil and gas drilling has on the environment. Powerful computers can detect where oil and gas is underground from further away, which reduces the number of exploration wells needed. And supports on the Trans-Alaska pipeline um, stabilise the temperature of the permafrost. So yeah, that's it. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed that. Please comment below any other suggestions and good luck in your exams. Thanks for watching.